Okay. Right at it. Okay. Okay. We got some stuff to go through. Some stuff to go through. So this has been uh, making uh, waves on Twitter. Probably throughout the discussion then as a result. Comprehensive re refutation of the Younger Dryas Impact hypothesis. I mean... The paper itself is not very visible. Like, we could read the abstract, blah, blah. Doesn't matter. They've, they've, they refute it, which is... Um, I already know it didn't happen. If you listen to what I say, then you know that I don't feel that way. And probably agree, hopefully. <laughs> if you've heard enough of my research, you probably agree that, that it wasn't an impact. Um... So, I didn't need persuaded, so I wasn't, like, looking for persuasion out of it. I was looking for evidence out of it. It doesn't really have evidence because it, because it's behind a paywall. It's not that it's not in the paper. It's because it's behind a paywall. But it, it like, discusses things, but it doesn't do so. Like, section 12, section 11, like... It's got a lot of sections in this paper, section snippets. We can't see the actual sections where there's data. All we can see up here is what I found when I was reading it to be almost like a little concerning. I mean, the one of the authors reached out to me. <laughs> Hilarious, because I was being rude probably. Like, this is what I said. While I obviously disagree with the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, as observations were caused by the Earth's expansion process, there is something off about this new paper. This is rude. My bad. My bad. It's rude to be doing this, but it's just voicing my opinion. Something is off about it because it uses the term pseudoscience. I mean... Like... It, it's a scientific paper. You don't call someone else's research pseudoscience in a scientific paper. But that this is a trend that's happening. Like this is not the first time that one of these like things going around Twitter that's like re refuting something has popped up. Like the the uh, video I did something it was about the graham hancock ancient apocalypse like where the entirety something with archaeology related where i had a scathing review of their review because they just were name calling and uh, like saying like no basis there were like blanket statements where they were like graham hancock is racist one and then reference them like <laughs> Or like reference some paper and it's like that's not sufficient you can't just like make a statement and put a number at it reference it and then i looked at the reference references and even a like official document in, in the graham hancock related one this one gave me that vibe by what is available what you can actually read here is very much just like nope just like no impact bullshit pseudoscience like if i go pseudoscience like it shouldn't really show up in this paper i mean it is referencing something else describing it as but then conclusions go on to say the younger driest impact hypothesis evolved directly from pseudoscience this this is like, you can't just make this statement, just FYI. You can't do this in science, because you have to prove what, what is pseudoscience. You're saying, by, by saying the word pseudoscience in a scientific paper, this is what I have issue with. It's, it's claiming that what isn't pseudoscience, which is what you practice, is science. That's what it's actually doing. It's saying, we've got science, they're noobs. We're experts, experts, noobs, science, expert, pseudoscience, noobs. It's not true though. 
you guys aren't like inherently better like you're also agreeing with pseudoscience so like it shouldn't be used as a term it's just like not representative of anything but name calling and that's what i don't like about it in in a scientific technical paper and i said so <laughs> I said it gives me the impression I got when reading the archaeology papers about Grant Hancock that we're attacking him as an individual with no regard for his basis. This one's way more regarding the basis, although the only actual thing I found we'll go into. Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis is a collection of different variant hypotheses and impact scenarios. So this this quote I found wanting, if you will, lacking. Like yes, at first glance, well, it's a collection of things that aren't really con like cohesively put together. Yeah, lots of people have theories. There's also lots of plate tectonics theories. There's also lots of earth expansion theories. Just because some of them are false doesn't mean the model is false. And so like the fact that there are a, a range of proposals doesn't really mean like one if one of them is true and you say this atop it, a collection of different variant hypotheses, regardless of what the topic is, then you're just throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It doesn't make fucking sense. So that was my my issue with that. Like, so they like what I saw was pretty persuasive. They right here. Basically, let me just finish this. Rife with hubris. Same. Which is perhaps, I mean, me, <laughs> perhaps understandable in archaeology, where like they don't really understand that they don't know what they're talking about. Maybe, maybe they're more open to just saying things like pseudoscience. Oh, like literally, the, I'm pretty sure the whole paper is about how Cram Hancock's research is pseudoscience and racist and all these just blanket claims that are bullshit in a scientific paper don't fucking talk like that in a scientific paper do it in a place like here where you got microphones hey look this is some bullshit it's pseudoscience here look at my paper where i explicitly detailed all of the flaws in their research i didn't just explicitly detail that it graham hancock is a racist pseudoscience <laughs> it's fucking nonsense but it's like similarly going on here there's a simple a simple younger dryas boundary impact scenario consistent with known this is a claim of the these are going through claims of the younger dryas impact consistent with known physics and all purported evidence Various, often conflicting and disjointed impact scenarios have been proposed and are necessary to explain the wide range of physical sediment constituents offered in support of an impact event, i.e. also include an impact also includes supernova event, surface impacts, and or aerial bolides. Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis of so Section 7, like we don't have access unless we pay or someone, since someone probably has access, I don't. The Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis is a collection of different variant hypotheses and impact scenarios that attempt to use the same purported set of evidence with unavoided conf unavoidable conflicts and contradictions. Like this statement is so, it's just so aggressive when the same thing can be said of plate tectonics. It can be said of every theory out there. Big Bang. Evolution. So, like, what are we doing? We're just attacking things we don't like, is what's happening in cases like this. And mind you, Younger Dry's impact hypothesis is not consensus. So, there, so it's, and it's the same for Graham Hancock. What he says is not consensus. It's his his interpretation and that of many people around him and people he references and things but it's not consensus so it's easy for like the dominant viewpoint to just like fucking shove get out of here which is what like strong language kind of does with unavoidable conflicts and contradictions yeah that's fine like, yeah you're right but like 
understand that applies to plate tectonics. Like, I don't know, maybe this mountain range at the middle of Australia. Yeah, let's just ignore it. We'll, we'll just pretend that by the Wilson cycle, we've provided an adequate explanation and hold the mic. Get away. We figured it out. Plate tectonics is true. See the problem? Like, it's not true, though. People don't know what they're talking about. So, like, this shit, that's my problem with it. It can be applied to a lot of things. The same reasoning without, like, the explicit basis that they go into for this case. The same general logic can be applied to basically science as a whole. I do hope, then I say, I do hope this paper is truly capable of in ending the debate around the younger dries impact hypothesis and waking some people up to the fact that it was not caused by impacts. People need to be looking for answers if they're going to find them and thinking the younger dries impact is true prevents looking because it's not true. So I hope this ends the debate and gets some of these people like Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock to be a little more willing to be like, maybe it's another thing that I'm not understanding. You know, that guy over there keeps telling me it's current flows atop the surface and really has persuasive evidence. <clears throat> anyway, science is no more science than the things termed pseudoscience. Less, it is purely derogatory. That's pretty much what it is. They're just name calling at that point. In a scientific paper, to use the term pseudoscience is just name calling, which is then derogatory in nature pertains to the character of the people in engaging in the hypothesizing. Oh, you're a pseudoscientist. You're not a scientist. It's an attack on the character and the advocation of a concept. People advocating up. The only people who support the Younger Dries impact aren't really engaging in science. They're engaging in pseudoscience. They're not engaging in science. And if we look at this paper, they're not like accounting for this wide spectrum of details. Whereas it's um, let me say, what, Anthony, here it is, here it is. As the younger dries impact has evolved, it has yet to converge into a hypothesis with a self-consistent scenario involving orbital dynamics, impact physics, geology, geochemistry, paleobotany, paleoclimatology, and anthropology. Like, okay, do it then. Like, give it a go. Like, just because it doesn't have these things doesn't disprove a damn thing. You gotta understand the standard model has a an entire population of people who their only option to actually be heard and participate is to work on the standard model. Yeah, go try working off the standard model and see how long your career lasts without, like me <laughs> my reasoning part if you participate in what i'm doing maybe you'll make it because you might have a voice enough but like these don't inherently mean just because they're not been done like it just could mean there's only so many people working on the impact hypothesis and they just put it forth here's our evidence they don't need to prove everything. Here's our evidence. And people didn't really follow up on it enough. I mean, it happens. So it's not really a thing to... It, it just goes to show, though, that, like, the standard model and people who generally lean in that direction think in a way that, like, something being, like, thorough it means it's true when it doesn't. Just because we have thorough description of reality doesn't mean we have true description of reality. So these added to the impact hypothesis could have been, and maybe even are in some ways. I'm like, I wouldn't be surprised if people at least like touch on some of these elements 
in ways, especially anthropology, which, by the way, like, anthropology. I was like, anthropology? Dude, we're talking about an impact. What are you guys doing? Talking about anthropology? That's so far down the line of things that matter. Like, sure, it, as long as it, it's got a match, but, like, it's so far down the line of considerations that it's barely relevant next to, like, just physics, not even the impact physics, just physics, geology, geochemistry. Yeah, those kind of things make, are more, like, central but like anthropology, that's that's that to me is because people up here are anthropologists, which you know if you if you read their paper, or if you read this, he points out communicated that the paper itself that originated the younger dries impact hypothesis which he refutes the hell this person refuted mark boslo refuted here i would say like he goes through these he's like look look at these graphs they're all like anomalous in certain ways the like, younger dries boundaries are just randomly chosen he, he pretty persuasively says they're just they're just going like by a hunch like here's where the boundary was we got a reading over here which we don't even elaborate on like there's no information on where this is coming from they don't say like we dated this <laughs> they just have it there kind of stuff where it's a little odd and then like this one this one's just ridiculous where is it this one's so ridiculous look at this line dot like data point supposedly data point 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 but there's this hump they literally inserted around the younger driest boundary that they marked around where they believe the younger driest boundary look at the image how did they know that they don't even have a dating on it they just inserted this hump there Her and wait, hump here. Also, these are different times 12.4, 13. Like the fact that this one goes to 12.4, this one goes to 13. Then this one um, up here doesn't say. I mean, in short, this, this, like the, the multiple, multiple spikes, things of that nature. Really, this paper that claims to be basis for the impact hypothesis and is largely referenced by people who do agree with the impact hypothesis although not that many times it sounds like this person's work firestone at all that this paper is is frequently referenced uh this one is frequently referenced as basis for the impact. And if we read the paper, uh, a carbon-rich black layer dated to dating to 12 about 12.9 has been previously identified at about 50 Clovis age sites. And they just go on to basically say an impact. And if we go down here though to their conclusions, conclusions usually have information in them. Like in conclusion, let me find a paper. Um, Let's go to my here, just real quick. Um, everything is pseudoscience, but the truth. That's important to understand. So, like, unless we have the truth, it doesn't even matter. But let's go find, say, this paper. Just a, go to a research paper that's not, like, controversial, really, as much. Oh, this is a, sorry, this is a, this is a thesis so maybe that's not good enough let's maybe try this one this one's not a thesis uncorrected but it's still elsevier like a, a paper for um 
like a standard art journal. So if we go to the conclusions, concluding remarks, the concept of Alice Springs orogeny related tectonic extrusion sprang an afternoon and blah, 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 blah. Main premises, newly proposed carboniferous pole path. So basically they're talking about things, New Guinea, reaching a paleo altitude latitudes of 30 to 40 degree north like discussing their conclusions right <laughs> let's go to this other paper now this is so this paper which is here conclusions conclusions our primary aim is to present evidence supporting the Younger Dry's impact event. That's not a conclusion, dude. So you're, this should not be in a conclusion section. So this is this is kind of if something pseudoscience, it's maybe people motivated by an aim to present evidence supporting an idea that they have. Like, that's their aim. That's our primary aim. We're, we're not, it really shows, we're, our aim isn't to, like, figure out the truth. It's to present evidence supporting the Younger Dry's impact of that. And then they go on to say, a major ET extraterrestrial collision over North America at 12.9 KA a thousand years ago, which contributed to the Younger Dry's cooling, the massive extinction of the North American fauna, major adaptations and population declines among Paleo-Americans. The unique carbon-rich Younger Dryas boundary layer, coupled with a distinct as assemblage of impact tracers, which the uh, Mark Boslow uh, discussion he has, uh, draws into question if these are even impact tracers. Like, these are not typically called impact tracers like magnetic spherules are not typically associated with impacts uh, and he i believe says like where is anyone else saying this could you point me to something and then he like pretty much is asking for the data if you if you read through this he's like anywhere at the end uh, it is possible that much of the confusion that springs from these graphs is simply attributable attributable to mistakes or miscommunication by the authors the best way to reduce the confusion would be for the authors to provide a table of all the data they use to make these plots and then that's what that's where it's kind of like all right i do you got them i pretty much was like you got them this is done their research is disproven that's firestone this is one paper possibly the entire spectrum of their paper it's easy to find online so they basically said he's like dude like i'm asking for your data you have to submit it or authors must make materials data and associated protocols available to readers must disclose upon submission of the manuscript any restrictions on the availability of materials or information then he goes on to say uh, like they're not doing this and like they're not complying failure to comply or preclude future publication in the journal and he says they haven't published since 2015 or 2016 like so maybe they're just not producing the data which you know when they got graphs that look like this it's highly like it literally if you were to be honest and just really you shouldn't have lines because you don't have data there but let's say you just draw a line like it's sh there's no world in which and as he points out like it looks like a microsoft excel connect like reminiscent of a microsoft excel outcome rather than a like something more technical like this is wishful thinking straight up there's and uh, basically goes into like all right these aren't these axes aren't even aligned and like here's zero here's zero they're off center and but in other ones they're much closer like over here like 75 70 minus 75 minus minus 75 but at times they're still not like aligned i think this one is not quite aligned this one's not aligned this zero and this zero, I guess they look pretty aligned to me, but it's hard to tell. This and this, you can tell this is a little shifted lower. 
than this one. Hard to say what's going on. The dashes are probably pretty similar, though. But, uh, like, the data is... It, as he puts it, it looks like a graphic designer did it, not like someone really aware of the technical requirements of the graph in a paper, and a graphic designer did it. And they even admit that a graphic design that we, we have a graphic designer on our team who did this. That is what they say, the authors. So, like, it really, like, he definitely refutes this evidence and disproves this paper and its, its conclusions. And when you see its conclusions, are literally our primary aim is to present evidence supporting the Younger Dry's impact event. That's not really a conclusion, that's a confession, I guess. <laughs> if anything, it's a confession, not a con conclusion. Okay, let's keep going to finish this conclusion. Unique carbon-rich Younger Dry's boundary layer coupled with a distinct assemblage of impact tracers implies isochroneity, like simultaneousness of the data of the Younger Dryas boundary datum layer, and thus highlights its utility. Isochroneity. Yeah, okay, I guess simultaneous. Thus highlights its utility for correlation and dating of the North American late Pleistocene. These associations, if confirmed, offer the most complete and recent geological record for an ET impact and its effects, such as global climate change and faunal extinction. This evidence also would represent a record of a major ET event having seared. Again, like, this is not how conclusions usually read. It's just not. I don't know how this passed the gauntlets of, like, of uh, peer review, honestly. That's what happens. People who agree, probably someone agreed and just passed it through without actually, like, forcing it to be more matching of a structure that is typical. This is just not typical. As someone who's read enough papers, uh, like, they're very methodically formed to a certain, like, structure where the conclusion usually is a conclusion and is not a confession. Okay. Um, but the same thing goes for this paper where it's, like, kind of stepping out of the boundaries of what is typical of a paper. And is much more just like using terminology that's a little uh, concerning. Like, I don't want to see a trend of papers that just start to name call and act like that's science. I don't want to see that happen. But because, like, people agree, if it's an idea that's outside of the norm, and people agree that it's like an idea that they disagree with. They, they agree in disagreement, but they're like in control of the conversation. It's much easier for that side of things to just like let things through that wouldn't typically go through that are just like name calling. So I'm a little disappointed that this paper is getting passed around when it's no one can access it except people paying for it or people with access through like institutions like if i still worked at the patent office so i could look this up and get this paper i would have access to this from the patent office as a government employee and i'm sure like at college universities people have access to these things because their universities are like paying these papers for access to their publications but like $28 for 48 hours is a joke dude I guess your paper's not that important that's how I look at it I guess it doesn't matter close alright let's move on that's enough of this that's enough of this topic 
So there's that going on. Close out this stuff. Close out this stuff. Okay. Unfortunately, I closed a little too much because one of the things the critique, the places, the, yeah, yeah. The places where they're looking are actually pretty interesting. Like, like Clovis. Clo this, this, I didn't realize the Clovis might people that they cl is claimed to have existed is based off of findings at Clovis, New Mexico. So I was like, where is it? It's over here, right? We've talked about how this is an ammonite, and we've talked about how a current flow went out of the ammonite, out of the end, over this way. Is it a coincidence? No, not a coincidence that Clovis, New Mexico, where these arrowheads are found, are is right in this line from the Ammonite of the Colorado Plateau. It's not a coincidence because they're not arrowheads. They're outcomes of this Ammonite breaking apart pieces of structures and then depositing them over here where they look like arrowheads because they actually were shaped by current flows which I talk about a episode where they're one of my episodes has an arrowhead as a picture in like 150 range maybe I don't know where um, and I really go into how current flows shapes the arrowhead and therefore draws into question. Mind you, Clovis culture, like the only evidence of it is these arrowheads pretty much. And so like the Firestone paper, I found kind of concerning. Like it, it found some over here, for instance, by Calgary. But they were saying things like the Clovis culture used the flint in the area. I'm like, dude, the Clovis culture has, like, no evidence. It didn't even exist. It literally didn't exist. It's a misinterpretation of a little bit of evidence that does exist. So to be making these claims in the Firestone paper, we're talking about the Younger Dries Impact event, it was highly concerning. And just, just shed light on the fact that, yeah, this is a little, little bullshit. Out there making claims like that in this paper. I can see why people are calling it pseudoscience, although they don't see it from the same angle as me. But that they're making claims like that doesn't really fly when I know that there's not a Clovis culture that existed. Okay, I don't want to get too caught up on this topic. How far are we? 34 minutes. I don't want to change subjects either at that point too much. So I still got to talk about trilobites. All these are Australia. Pretty much Australia geology lectures. So, I'm trying to think. Let's go to my downloads, I guess. I took pictures. Out 
Alice Springs, Rajani. This is from a, one of the lectures. Probably this one. I think it's from this one. It's only 10 minutes. I don't want a lecture. At that point, it's more of like a, I don't know, a nine minute lecture. But, uh, they basically show reheating event, which we've already talked about how the reheating really points to a, um, magmatic source of the orogeny, something to do with a magmatic source. Oops, wrong way. Thermal history models predict slower cooling than observed in the Pine Creek orogeny. Onset of cooling coeval with Alice Springs orogeny. So the Pine Creek orogeny Onset of cooling was coeval simultaneous with the Alice Springs orogeny. So here's the thermal history, 150, 160 down here. Going up here to 20-ish of cooling. Over here, around the same, around 400 MA million years radiometric dating to 200 what they have marked here. This one goes 400 to around 100, but then... So it doesn't quite match this portion, but it matches here, like like where it starts at least. Pine Creek Orogeny Onset uh, Coeval, which is interesting. So here's the Pine Creek Shear Zone. Notice Darwin. So Darwin is up at the north tip here, over here in this area. So pine... Creek. Let's just say here. It's that'll give us a good idea where this orogeny is. I'm not. I'm not sure exactly. It's a, It's in this area. Maybe here. I don't. I don't know. Maybe this graph will help us. Looks like there's Darwin here. So it's pretty much in around it, I guess. I'll get to it though. Um, widespread thermal signature, and then this has ages. So most of it happened around the same time, around 400. Alice Springs age, 400, 300 cooling signatures are common across central Australia. As well down here, southern central. I guess all just, all central. Common across central. Notice there are the Terra Australis orogeny boundary is, is very, very related to this boundary. The magnetic anomaly map boundary where current was flowing in, in this region especially. So this region kind of formed a oversurface boundary in this to create this region. Not sure why there's a boundary over there in the same way. Certainly not like one to one, but related. Suggestive of a widespread thermal perturbation. So cooling signatures throughout Australia from this time frame. Okay, so that's what we're getting at. They're throughout Australia, including up here. And what's up here? But the nucleus of the ammonite. So at the nucleus of the ammonite, of all places for them to be talking about, at the nucleus of the ammonite, Pine Creek orogeny is cooling from 400 to 300 million radiometric dating. And then at the final chamber of the ammonite, which is basically like the new nucleus as it radioactively decays, because it's an atom that's radioactively decaying from this nucleus out this way, to then have a new nucleus over here kind of thing. These two locations happen to be the ones that they're talking about 
I don't think it's an accident. I think it's because of the relationship here, where within here, it did fill, and then it vented, and it cooled when it vented, but that venting happened around 400 to 300 million radiometric dating. So let's look at, let's compare that to this. So there's a lot down here that's earlier and then yeah, more normal, like more of the same time. This stuff's earlier, I guess, over around this area. And then younger down here. This one, the, the eyes up here, there's another eye here. It's not really visible in the terrain. We see these two eyes. Down here, there's another one that's not quite as visible, but it's more clear in the data here, the magnetic anomaly data, more like another nucleus like this. I don't know what to make of it exactly, but it seems like there's also one down there. So I would say that's probably related to this. Like if we can pinpoint these, these dots look like they may be related to here. These are related to the center. These ones are related to the location we've been talking about over here. It's almost like a boundary here, like an ammonite that has an end here, and then it continues over here if we go to shallograms. It's reminiscent of how we'll do this, have like an inner boundary, so like that location there. is maybe like this, where there's like an ammonite here, like one here, and then a continuation off of it, like this one that goes around like a half rotation with, without really this one maybe. Goes around a half rotation from here to here, like this. I mean, relatively something of that nature. It forms like the next block, but then it ends the structure there. Because I don't think the structure really continued. Maybe there was a time before it got eroded where the surroundings kind of had a structure of a larger ammonite, and that's what this is. That really wrapped around again, and then it got reshaped so substantially that we can't even make it out except for the region that wasn't influenced by it. I don't know. That's possible. I don't know why that region would be protected. Just because of the way it vented here or something. If that were to be the case, I don't know. But there's certainly a relationship between the orogenies in Australia that were going on, especially around the 400 to 300 million year time frame and this ammonite. Also, there was something else interesting, like, uh, with regard to the north-south, um, I don't know if I can find it. Pine Creek Orogeny, Arnhem Province, to the east of Pine Creek Orogeny. Thermal history models predict slower cooling when observed. Onset of cooling coeval with Alice Springs Orogeny. Cooling signatures are common across central Australia, 400 to 300 million. Uh, nope. Darn, I didn't write it down. Let's see if it's in here. 
basically something to do with the north-south compression at the Pine Creek orogeny, or the, the whatever it's causing, like north-south faulting at Alice Springs also happened at the Pine Creek orogeny, but it was much less, which I found a little odd. I don't know where I heard it or who said it, if it was in this one. Might have been in a different one. Up, mid Paleozoic uplift, Coeval. So it's an uplift in the mid Paleozoic, which was 400, 300 when this heat was venting. So it's basically ballooning and then popping. Like ballooning enough to stretch the surface above to then have a venting path. That occurred at Alice Springs orogeny and I guess Pine Creek orogeny. And probably others that I don't know the names of. Like this other one. P the Peterman orogeny. Although that one dates to 550 million years, which is really when the Earth started to expand. Like the process began. There's a lot of a lot of nuance in Australia of that nature to really go through. Okay. Um Yeah, so there's that. Those are things. Those are things. Trying to think if there's anything else. In terms of the th topics we're talking about. Oh. There's also salt di diapers. Let's see where they're most prevalent. Maybe that one. Flanders, something or other. Flinders ranges. It was like Akira Flinders. That place down here. I believe it is this. At least this. Which has like a notably kind of chakra thing going on here with a. Like, it's got a chakra there, and a chakra there, relatively. Not sure what to make of it exactly. So there's lots of salt. Probably throughout. But especially at that boundary where I was draining. So I'm thinking there's salt in the water that the water is heat exchanging. And that is what's causing the deposition of the salt, really. Like, it's salt water, but it... And in a lot of instances, it's salt water, but it is typically... like within the water unless there's a region like like over here where the water's going out and interacting with uh with the undercurrent's heat 
that's literally like boiling the water and separating it from the salt and making the salt precipitate out. I don't know if that would like... Yeah, I mean, just pretty much boiling. When you boil water, evaporate, the water evaporates and salt, which was in that water, retained as white precipitate. So it's pretty much just exchanging with the salt water enough to deposit it, deposit the salt out of the water in certain locations. I, that's my interpretation. And um, I think I closed it. These are salt. Um, whew, I don't know what I was even looking for anymore. Salt inclusions, so the salt will have inclusions. There's a, it's salt, the salt is definitely complex and lots to it. That's interesting. But it's basically being deposited. And... Like these ways. Salt roller, salt anticline, salt sheets, bulb stem, salt stock, salt, salt glacier on surface, salt pillow, salt welt, detached salt stock, teardrop diaper, detached salt sheet. And like, there's all sorts of things going on in terms of how the salt can shape. So, like, precipitating out and then can like in specific locations that's right that's right now i remember and she was saying at this salt at the flan at the flinders if i can find it i might have passed it now that i remember what i'm looking for maybe this one Like at the diaper, this is volcanism. So this is the diaper, the salt. But within it is volcanism. So the question is, what's causing this? Like did the did the volcano volcanism uh, cause something to do with this? One second. So my thought is, well, maybe whatever was, like, venting here was venting here. It was gonna vent here. Maybe it didn't yet. So maybe, like, it was starting to vent the heat, especially from this location. And thereby was, like, exchanging the heat directly into the water and really boiling it, making it precipitate the salt right there. So that there is a relationship in the location of the precipitation of the salt and the volcanism. That kind of makes sense to me. Whether or not that's like what's happening always would be maybe not. So I don't know, but it's it's something of interest that there is this tie between the two, the volcanism and the salt here at this location. The Flinders Ranges diaper, at least this one that she's referring to. I don't know how big this is. 
Okay, I'm going to stop for now. I'll be back. Uh, see you guys in the next one. Peace out.